Hey, it's Claudia Manchanda, medical herbalist, radical herbalist here at the Vale of Health on Hampstead Heath where American Werewolf in London was filmed in the 70s where the werewolves like running naked through the woods. It's here, that's where I am and um, I'm just so happy this week because I am very excited to see Flyer Garrix. And here they are, these beautiful toadstools. And I think there are, uh, the name for this one is Amanita muscarina. And I think there's about four or five varieties of this particular type. And here, look, there's a few. There's one, I don't know if you can see, there's one over there too. And apparently there's several further up. And um, when they start to grow, they look like a little white egg in the ground that's covered in a membrane. And the membrane breaks upon opening from which the toadstool grows through and um, it becomes um, something called the universal veil. And you can see this little skirt that's the remnants of the universal veil and the spots that are on top are remnants of the universal veil. Um, these um, toadstools are mycorrhizal and they have a relationship with the roots of the trees that they're symbionts with and fly agaric, these mushrooms, are symbionts with birches, um, conifers, firs, pine. So if we have a look around, it's growing amongst the, the ivy, you'll see that there's actually, I don't know if you can see, but there's a birch tree there. So there'll be the, these fly garricks will be having um, a kind of um, yeah, uh, uh, interesting relationship with each other, which I'm sure humans don't know much about, but, but it will be including sharing chemical messengers and the mushrooms probably getting carbohydrates from the roots of the, the betula, the birch tree. What's really interesting about this symbiotic relationship is that unlike psilocybin mushrooms which are sort of very popularized in um, psychedelic and entheogenic cultures is that uh, psilocybin mushrooms are cultivated but fly garricks can't be cultivated because they have to dwell in nature within their symbiotic relationships and I really like that about them and there's something quite sacred about them and I think it's because they're actually you know not as common as some mushrooms and the time that they're um, visible especially in London is it feels always like a small window and like a special window of time and apologies I cut out there what I was trying to say is these mushrooms hold a presence that's quite formidable and I think you know they have the archetypal red and white kind of warning colours um, but they also have a really peaceful beautiful air about them if you see here they have a fly on them and they're called fly agaric see because they attract flies and they were um, or are used as insecticides and um, and they attract the ibutenic acid this um, the, this alkaloid in the mushroom attracts flies and kills them and in a lot of Eastern European and Russian culture, they put the mushrooms in water, in bowls of water, 
or in sources of milk to attract fly house flies and kill them and the name Mus muscaria it amanita muscaria i think musca is the latin for housefly i could be wrong but i think that's where the origin came from i always assumed fly agaric was called fly agaric because of like flying potions and it's association with mysticism but it's not it's literally to do with its insecticidal properties from the ibutenic acid so this mushroom steeped in a lot of ancient tradition stories um, it's reportedly um, one of the entheogenic properties in soma and the rig veda um, there are these um, petroglyphs the Pet the Pegtimel petroglyphs, they're kind of etchings, I think, onto crystal from crystal quartz in Pevek in Russia, and they show dancing mushroom people. I think they're estimated to be about 2,000 years old, and they show images, really beautiful images, and of dancing people with mushrooms on their heads, and they clearly have like hips and breasts and kind of very archetypal, archetypal feminine features and they're called the mushroom people. And apparently um, Siberian so-called shamans, I don't like the word shaman really, um, collect fly garricks from the birch forest because of the traditional story of the great raven who ate the mushroom and became so strong it carried a bag as big as a whale and the spirit of the mushroom called Wapang um, imparted instructions for the raven to follow and these also um, were imparted to humans so when humans have the mushrooms they give messages to follow. So let's move on to chemical messengers from this plant, uh, medicinal use and cautions. So the plant contains water-soluble chemicals called alkaloids. One of them is ibotenic acid, which is a isoxazole alkaloid. I could hardly say that. And um, it's converted um, through heating and through um, dehydration via a chemical process called decarboxylation and decarboxylation is when you remove something called the carboxyl group which releases carbon dioxide and then it turns into a chemical called muscimol so muscimol is way stronger than ibutenic acid and it's the one that's more pharmacologically active. Another name for muscimol is pantherine, and that's because another Amanita pantheria contains a lot more muscimol and is considered a lot more toxic. Um, muscimol is a potent agonist, a selective agonist of GABA-A receptors. GABA stands for GABA aminobutyric acid and those receptors are things like um, benzodiazepines and barbiturates um, bind to um, GABA receptors so it's quite different to the way that let's say psilocybin works. Um, some of the effects of GABA binding include sedation, depression, drowsiness, um, dissociation and retrograde amnesia. Um, there are also chemicals in the mushroom that make you feel um, sort of nauseous and can cause vomiting and especially if the mushroom is raw. However, um, this mushroom is used in some cultures for food like in Hodako um, where the pumpkins are from and um, but when it's eaten, it's detoxified. I know that squirrels, slugs, reindeers, bears love to eat it. And often you'll be walking along and you see a fly agaric and it's got a big bite out of it. And it's often something like a squirrel or a slug that's eaten it. 
Um, other chemicals in this mushroom include um, muscarine. Uh, muscarine is a very small amount of um, quantity in the cap of the mushrooms and that binds to acetylcholine receptors and is parasympathomimetic and parasympathomimetic means it mimics the actions of the parasympathetic nervous system which is which causes salivation lacrimation crying urination and defecation so if you have high amounts of it you'd want to go to the toilet there are some other herbs i know there's some amazonian herbs that are very high in chemicals um with muscarine in um Going back to the ibutenic acid, the one that's converted to muscimol, it's also a potent NMDA agonist um, of, a, of a group of um, receptors called 1 and 2 uh, metabotrophic glutamate receptors. I know these are very long words. These are for the medical herbalists who want to know more. And they have a role in the excitotoxicity of this mushroom. And in very small amounts, it's one of the psychotropic um, properties of this plant. And in large amounts, it's called a brain lesioning agent. So it actually leaves scars on the brain. So, you know, in high amounts, the, this um, mushroom is toxic. But in, um, in very safe amounts and in and used wisely and in traditional ways, this um, mushroom is used as a medicine. Like many mushrooms, this, um, this toadstool contains complex polysaccharides um, and often complex polysaccharides are biological response modifiers. There are two in this plant that have been studied. I think it's alpha D-galactan and beta D-galactan and they're active against melanoma in vitro. 